Okay, hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Um, my name is Josephine Williams and I'm the Events and Partnerships Manager at IDP. And on behalf of IDP and IEAA, thank you very much for joining us today. We're absolutely delighted to have um, colleagues from all around Australia and even some from overseas. So a big welcome to you all. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge um, that I'm hosting this webinar on the lands of the Bunwurrung people, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all are today. Now joining me today for this session is Louise Gould, Program Chair for AIC. Hello, Louise. Hi, hi everybody, welcome. We've got lots to get through, um, but first just a few housekeeping and important announcements. Um, so we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation at the end of each section, as well as at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat. And um, you can find the Q&A usually at the bottom main Zoom control, usually on the bottom bar there of your screen. Um, if we can't get through all the questions today, we will then um, answer them offline and post them on the AIC website. And the recording of this video should be available by the end of uh, tomorrow. So that will be also on the website. Now, as you're aware, we're about eight months uh, away from hosting AIC on the Gold Coast this October from the 18th to the 21st of October. Um, we're still moving ahead with our plans to deliver a hybrid event for the third time. And our focus this year, however, will be on the in-person experience. And we know this is what people want. They want to connect in person, but there will also be an, uh, an option to attend the event virtually you know, um, given the success that we had last year with our virtual event. So um, what we've learned from COVID over the last two years is that things can change at any moment. So we're also obviously also um, preparing for plan B, which is um, to go fully online if we have to, but we are gonna do everything we can to see each other in person this October. So I'd like to thank um, all of our partners uh, for their support. And, um, and we'll also be launching the new prospectus for the sponsorship and, and exhibition opportunities in March. So if you're interested in participating in that way, um, please do sign up for our newsletter and keep an eye out. So that will be launched in March. Um, now, we encourage you to stay connected um, in many different ways. So we're on social media, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, um, Instagram. And um, like I said, all news will be pushed through our newsletters and can be also available at our website. If you still have questions, you can email us at AIC at IDP.com directly. Now, today we've got a lot to cover. Um, and so we wanna get started as soon as possible. So first we'll have a look at what a hybrid conference actually means for both attendees and speakers. Uh, but then we'll go into what the theme is. We'll have a look at the topics, some suggested topics. We'll, Louise will go through the review and selection criteria, which is, will be really important for the call for proposals. Uh, what are key interest areas and why they're important? What the different session types and formats are available at AIC? And also we'll finish uh, off with some tips that hopefully will help you craft a successful proposal for AIC this year. So um, before I hand over to Louise on, um, on the theme, just a reminder of, of what a hybrid kind of means from a program perspective. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that most of, I'd say um, all of the keynotes and plenaries will be live stream and broadcast. So they will be available for both in-person and virtual delegates, but we won't be live streaming all of the sessions, uh, all of the concurrent sessions. Those that are live stream and broadcast, they will also be available on demand and they will be available on demand for up to two months after the conference. And they will be available for both virtual and in-person delegates as well. Um, we expect uh, most all speakers that can travel to the Gold Coast to travel to the Gold Coast, but we will make exceptions if um, in case there's international travel restrictions that come about or a particular speaker can't attend for any other um, reasons that beyond their beyond their control. But we're really, really focusing on an in-person experience wherever possible. 
Um, so I think with that, I mean, we'll, we'll take questions in a minute. And um, Louise, I think perhaps we start off by just reminding everyone of the theme Beyond Borders this year. Please. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm sure all of you know, if you're on this, this link, you've seen the theme for, for AIEC 2022, uh, which is a positive theme about Beyond Borders. I um, mean, as, as you all know, I mean, I'm not going to read all of this out, but education by its very nature is borderless. So we cross borders, we do that virtually, we do that physically, um, normally. The pandemic has thrown a whole lot of challenges um, towards all countries. Um, so, so some countries, you know, including Australia, the borders have been closed, even state borders. So the, the, the idea this year is to sort of think beyond borders, both physical borders, both um, um, ideological borders, I suppose, and, and borders that prevent us being creative. Um, we're hoping to be reun reunited this year, as Josephine said. Um, if you want more information on the theme, please go to the website. There's quite a detailed explanation about what we mean. Um, so just be creative in, in the way you think about um, the, the border theme, because because it's a bit broader than, than, as I said, just those physical borders. Um, I'm going to drop, uh, sorry, go straight in now to the review and selection criteria for the, for the conference. This is really important. This either makes or breaks your proposal. Um, we're gonna give you seven key points to think about um, that we take into mind when we're reviewing the proposals that come in. Okay, so the first one, obviously, um, is the relevance to international education. One of the most common reasons for rejection is it's a really interesting idea, has nothing to do with international education. So make the connection um, very clear where you, where you can. The second point is around innovation and originality. If we could have the next slide, thank you. Um, so, so really it's about, is this something new? Are you gonna add to our body of knowledge? Are you, is it original? Is it just a repeat of something that's already out there? So one of the, the reasons for rejection is that there's not enough new information in your proposal or it's been presented at previous conferences on multiple times, you know, multiple occasions, or it's widely known or freely available out there. So really think about the innovation and originality. The third um, sort of selection uh, criteria that we go to is applicability and solutions oriented. So how does this relate to what we do as international education professionals? Are there solutions there that other people can try? Um, so so that, that's a really important thing. So it might be um, a case study that you present, for example, that showcases um, something that provides solutions and ideas or a toolkit for others to draw on. The fourth key point is around providing some sort of insight, insight into new information, um, new ideas, new strategies, you know, th things that really help us to learn and grow in our, in our industry. The fifth point is around um, quality of research or the methodology. So if your proposal is around a particular research piece, you know, what was the methodology? Is it proven methodology? What was the size of the sample? So these things you really need to draw out. Um, and and a, a tip is that use the additional information field in the online form to really tease out the information and spell out the information about your particular research proposal or your research that you've completed. Uh, the sixth one is the expertise of the speaker. So it's really important that you have demonstrated expertise in the area in which you want to speak. Proposals that stand out, it can be experts from outside the international education sector who we can learn from. That's really important. It doesn't always have to be navel gazing in terms of just looking at who's already involved in the international ed sector. Bring in external experts if they've got something to offer us. Um, common reasons for rejection too under the speakers is either some or none of the speakers are actually identified. Really great proposal in theory, but we don't know who's going to present it. And just saying we'll get back to you on the speakers doesn't help in terms of us knowing might be a good idea, but we may not be convinced that you've got the right speakers for that proposal. Um, it might be that some of the speakers have been identified, but they're either unconformed or they haven't actually been invited. So 
The other reason is speakers' profiles are missing. We really, really need to know who the speakers are. So as I said, often we get really good proposals, they're rejected because we don't know who the speakers are or, you know, it's just not clear, not clear to the review uh, panel. Okay, the seventh and a very important reason is um, the big pitch. So if this is, if, if a proposal comes across as a sales pitch, and it's commercial, it's not going to be accepted. So we have a non-commercial policy that we need to adhere to. So please keep that in mind. Now, if you've got, um, you know, a, a piece of technology or, you know, a, a, a concept or a service that you're trialling and there's some research around it and we're presenting the outcomes of it, that's different. What we don't want is people getting up, selling a product, selling a service. That's just, it's not acceptable. Um, so in summary, um, there are seven key criteria that we use. One of the other things I want to just add, um, and it will come up in the hot tips later, but just to reinforce it, is the student voice is really important. Where possible, please try and build in the student voice. Either have a student on your panel or have some evidence from students in terms of what students are thinking and saying. Now, if you want more information on the review and selection criteria, it's all on the website, please just go to the website. Um, jo, are there any questions in the Q&A? Yeah, there's, there's one from Sam. Um, do speakers need to be known in the international educa uh, education sector? Do they need to be known? They don't need to be known, but I, I mean, in terms of the speaker profile, the bios, you're going to actually sell yourself that way. So as long as the concept or the proposal is applicable, we've got something to learn from it in, in our industry. You don't have to be from the industry. I hope that that makes sense. Any other no. questions? No, I might just add a, a comment to the sales pitch that um, I felt in previous years, um, one way to get around that as well is if you do have a product that you want to push because it's it's um, commercially available. Another option to present it in a way that um, it gets through is to bring in a third party, someone who has used it and show how that product can be used in different ways for other organizations. So that sometimes is a possibility, right? Louise, I think we've had a few of successful sessions in that space. We have, we have. And the, the other one other comment I'll just make, and Josephine mentioned it quite early on, is in terms of the speakers, there is the expectation this year that they, the speakers will be on site at the Gold Coast, assuming the world doesn't go a little bit crazy again. Um, we do realise sometimes there are exceptional circumstances, but this year we want to reunite. We all want to be there together. Um, so, so that's the idea. Louise, there's one more question not related to the review selection criteria, but I think um, let's um, let I'll, it's from Dan. How many speaking places are there and are there any options around the length of the sessions? I think we might be covering a little bit of that, yeah. uh, but what about the speaking spots? Do you want to maybe reveal Look, how many spots we've got? There's not many. Can I say that? Um, there, there's not many. The speaking spots are limited, so it's going to be highly competitive this year. Um, off the top of my head, Josephine, I can't actually remember the exact number, but it's not a huge number. And I think we'll come to that in a little while when we get to the session type. So maybe, Dan, if you could just hold on for a couple of minutes until we get to that section, and then we might reveal um, a little bit more information or give you a bit more sense of how this, this program is going to work this year. But it is highly competitive, so make your proposal stand out. Yeah. Sure. So maybe um, we can continue on. There are no other questions, Louise. Okay. So we might move on to the, the key interest areas. So these are, um, we call them um, KIAs, the KIAs. These are sometimes called conference tracks or special interest groups or, or whatever you want to term, you want to think streams sometimes. But these are just the categories under which we um, organise our conference and organise our sessions to make sure we've got a really good balance uh, in the program so that there's actually something for everyone. Um, so I'm just quickly going to uh, pop up a slide around um, the key interest areas. So we have, as you see, um, it's, I can never remember, it's 11, isn't it, Josephine, is it 11? Uh, <laughs> um, look, some of the, 15. the key, 15, oh my God, I can't even count quickly. Um, 
<laughs> four of them are obviously aligned to the education sectors. So English language, higher education, vocational education, um, and schools. Then we have a group that are specifically aligned to a speciality within the IEAA, so the International Education Association of Australia, for those joining us from overseas, to a network. So under that, we've got the admissions and compliance stream, uh, learning abroad, pathways, marketing, scholarships and fellowships, students, teaching and learning, and t and &E, transnational education. Then we have three remaining ones that aren't actually aligned to an IEA a network, but are specialty areas. And they are the business development and strategy track, which I actually am the, the uh, track chair for that, employability, so the graduate outcomes, think of it in that space, and professional development. And in terms of PD, we're actually thinking about PD for people in our industry. So if you've got an idea that's, that's a professional development opportunity for our delegates, that's what we mean, mean by that. Um, I'm going to actually flick to Josephine and say, Joe, do you want to sort of explain why the key interest areas are, are important to the call for proposals and how they, how they link in? Absolutely, Louise. So understanding the key interest areas and how we use them to filter the program and assign reviewers is really important. So we, we want you to select the correct filters and give us the correct information so that we can allocate your proposal to the appropriate reviewers and of course, subject matter experts. So on the form, on the online form, um, you'll actually get asked several questions around key interest areas. And, um, and so we can understand what this session is about and who it will appeal to, so what the target audience is. So first you'll be asked, is this specific to a sector or is it more than one sector? So we wanna know, is it specific for the VET target audience or is it more broader and cross-sectoral? So that's the first question we want you to answer. Um, we also ask you to pick one key interest area, and this is a single choice. It's not always easy for everyone, um, but we'll ask you to pick just the one, um, the one main one. And here we've actually excluded higher education because higher education does uh, apply to too many. So in this particular case, you'll only have 14 options. And then the next question is where you get to um, indicate if there are any other interest areas that might be relevant to the content of your proposal. And that is multiple choice. And we ask you to stick to about three of them. Uh, and here you can also select higher education. So if it's very specific to uh, people working in universities, for example, then that, that would be where you would tick that. Um, there's also a question around keywords. And you'll notice in that, in that question that some of the keywords uh, might not be the keywords that you would have selected. The reason we ask this question is because there's often topics that cross over multiple key interest areas. And I'll give you an example. For example, work integrated learning could fit very easily under employability or very easily under um, teaching and learning, for example. And it doesn't really matter where, which key interest area you select as the main one. What we just wanna make sure is that we can um, actually have a broad view of all of the different proposals that might touch on that particular topic. So you'll see there's about 20 different options. Um, and if none of them apply, if none of them are central to the, your proposal, that's no problem. You just, um, we just wanted to highlight some of them. And then finally, the target audience is a text field where we just allow you to give us more information about who do you have in mind when you come to the conference and you deliver that session? Who are you thinking of uh, in terms of audience? Who, who are you speaking to? So those five questions will be in the form and there's no right or wrong answer. So don't think that because you select all sectors that you're going to have better chances or you know even if you make a mistake in your selections that's okay there's no right and wrong it's just to help us understand what do you have in mind eight months before the event as to what you want to deliver so that we know what you're actually going to deliver on the day um, in terms of the presentation or, or the session itself so Louise that's that's I think um, what I wanted to cover I don't know I don't know if there's any questions there, there are I've actually this. got there's, there's two from Mary one's technical okay. and rather easy um, so I'll go with that one first uh, okay. Mary's asked does the online submission form allow you to save when incomplete and log back into complete 
Okay, so um, that's a good question. So when you submit the proposal, it will say submitted done, but you can log back in at any time until the deadline, the 1st of March. So we will not be looking at the proposals or reviewing them or doing anything until the 1st of March, because we know that people like to be able to work on it um, again and again. So you can look, it's not a draft, it is submitted, so it is in our system, uh, but you can edit and add and change as much as you want right up, up until the deadline, Louise. Yeah, because no one will be reviewing it, Maria, until the deadline no. has gone. So you've got freedom there. The other question for Mary is a tricky one. Uh, she says, if we miss out on a speaker's spot, does one of the alternative session types, for example, a panel, become a possibility? Mary, the answer is sort of maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, well, no, we've we've got that choice, Louise. Remember, um, if you have a six, if you select a sixty-minute panel, uh, there will be a, a next question that will say, if you miss out on this, would you like to be considered for a fifteen-minute presentation? So, if you tick yes to that. What will happen is um, when we review, if we can't give you that 60 minute slot, but we think the topic could be covered in a shorter period of time, and you've said yes, we will then go back to you and maybe possibly ask you to either resubmit or, or, or modify the, the submission, because obviously a 60 minute session is quite different to 15 minutes, but at least you have the, we, ha we know that you'll be open to that opportunity and we will contact you. If you say no, we won't, we won't consider you for 15 minutes. It will, we will accept it or, or, or decline it based on the information that you've provided us at the time. And that is important to remember, um, the, the, the fact that if you don't tick, yes, I want to be considered for something else, um, it would be a straight rejection if, if we didn't think it was um, able to make the, the main program. Um, I've got another anonymous attendee question. Can you make multiple submissions or is there only one per organisation? Louise, that's one for you, I think. <laughs> I knew you'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we... we you can make more than one submission. What we don't want is people thinking, I'm going to increase my odds of being accepted by putting in 10. That will just actually go against you in the review because it looks like um, a, a bit of a grab to just try and get a spot. So what we advise you to do is think very carefully about what you're submitting. It's okay to put more than you know, one, but please don't put in three or four or five um, because that that's just, you know, we need variety across the program as well. So there's no way they're all going to be accepted. So think really carefully about which one you think is the best quality proposal you've got to offer us. Um, and, and, and just think of, think of it that way. I would avoid multiple submissions where, where are possible. Yeah, we, we don't have a rule, but we do try to keep um, a maximum of, say, two or three speakers, sorry, one speaker and maybe two or three spots maximum. Usually it's two. Um, obviously, if they're an expert in a particular area and there's, you know, multiple panels, then it, it might stretch to three. Um, but we do try to keep it to just one or two. And, and purely also, not just for the balance that Louise was talking about, but also from a scheduling perspective, it gets quite tricky when we've got lots of speakers in Correct. many different sessions. Um, so, so yeah, do curate your uh, sessions and your ideas. If you're really stuck and you and you want some guidance, send an email to aic at idp.com and just um, lay out what are the different kind of ideas that you have, even just very high level, and say, are there any of these that resonate more with the program committee? And what we'll do is we'll filter that through to the track chairs. So each of those key interest areas have a representative on, on the program committee, and they'll respond to you if you really need that guidance so that at least you're not crafting 10 different things and, and just, you know, and, and really focusing on the one or two ideas that might be of most relevant uh, relevance right. for this year's program and, and the next little bit we're going to go into might help you a little bit with your with your thinking yeah so I'm I'm going to sort of um sorry Joe. I think actually this is you um I'm going to talk about some of the key priorities or uh topics of interest for this conference um for this year's conference is what I should say so so we go through a bit of a process with the 
AIEC Steering Committee and the Program Committee and some other experts that we draw on um, as we're building the, the conference to get a sense of what the key topics are that absolutely must be in this year's conference. Now, this is not a comprehensive list, okay? This is not a comprehensive list. This is just a selection of some of the suggested topics that we'd really like to see in this year's program that are going to be important to our delegates. Um, I'm not going to read through them all. You will find the full list um, on the AIEC website. Um, but as you can see, that there's nothing um, that you wouldn't expect to see, I think. Um, but things around the rebuilding, the reinvigorating, the uh, pathways, the uh, career readiness of graduates, mental health and well-being for both students and for staff and for the professionals in our industry. It's not just for the students. Um, case studies of, of good practice, strategies for diversification of source markets. You know, we're all told you must, uh, you've got to diversify, you've got to diversify, but we need to know how do we diversify? Where do we diversify? What does that look like? Um, and also the policy and politics side of things in terms of government policies, government intervention, uh, perceptions of particular countries. So this just gives you a sense of the sorts of things we'd really like to see in this year's program. So I might, um, are there any questions, Joe, before I move on? You're muted, Joe. Rookie mistake. Uh, no, there are no uh, new questions, Louise, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. Okay, so look, we're gonna move on now to session types. And Dan, I think this was sort of one of the things you were talking about. We haven't actually listed the numbers in here. Um, but this year we've mixed it around a bit. Okay, it's always good to be have a you know fresh approach to the way we we run the conference, um, particularly after last year's virtual conference. So the session formats that we're going to be using uh, this year, there are four that you can opt for through the call for proposals. Um, as you can see, they go from the sort of less interactive, more formal presentations through to highly interactive, pretty casual sort of conversations with, with colleagues. So the four we've got, 15 minute presentations, which will be rapid fire. No chair, in the, oh, sorry, well, there's a facilitator in the room, but what it will be, we think, if you can visualize two, two lecterns on a stage, a facilitator who says, now we're going to hear from um, Mrs. Smith, who's going to talk about blah. Mrs. Smith gets up and does a 15 minute presentation, no Q and A. As that, that one's wrapping up, the second speaker is introduced and goes on stage and does their 15 minute and so on and so on. So there's gonna be these rapid fire 15 minute presentations. I'm sure you're all familiar with the old lightning presentations we did, um, you know, very, very short. We feel 15 minutes is, is better. It's a better sort of um, approach. It will allow hopefully um, to create interest with the audience whereby they can come and talk to you afterwards or you know, make a brain date with you, which Josephine will talk about in a minute. So they're pretty rapid fire, straight presentations. And yes, of course, PowerPoints are fine. Um, the other three are 60 minutes in, uh, in length. So we've got panels, round tables, and cafes. So panels, you're gonna have obviously three or four speakers on stage, which includes the chair. Please don't put up panels with six speakers because it just, it just doesn't work time-wise with, with 60 minutes. You're gonna have 40 minute presentation time, and a 15 minute Q&A that would be facilitated by the chair at the end. Um, the round table is a bit more formal. Um, the, 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 you have two or three presenters, you have a rapporteur um, and a moderator, and it's whole group interaction rather than small group interaction, if that makes sense. So you're gonna have some short presentations to get people thinking, and it's whole group discussion, um, and then a reporting back by the rapporteur at the end about the key outcomes of that meeting. So they're usually around you know, fairly high level um, topics and formal topics. Then the cafe, I think you've all been to AIC, the fabulous cafe sessions. They're a bit more relaxed, they're small group, they're really interactive. Um, there's no pre presenters, there's no formal presentations. You've got facilitators at various tables. You've got 40 minutes discussion time. You've got 10 groups then reporting, reporting back, uh, 10 minutes, sorry, for the group reporting back. Um, there's usually a facilitator at each of the tables. 
and they can be on any topic you like that's important to a particular key interest area or to the industry in general. Um, and it's more relaxed at atmosphere. We try and make the tables look a bit more like a cafe, like there might be some a vase of flowers on the table or, or something like that. So they're the sort of sessions that we're going for. So there are four types only this year, which hopefully will make it a bit easier. As Josephine mentioned um, a few minutes ago, if you put in a proposal for a 60 minute panel or a round table or a cafe, and you would like to be considered for a 15 minute presentation, if your first choice is not successful, please tick yes, you know, consider me for a 15 minute presentation. Again, a lot more information, uh, including ideas about room setup and so on, can be found on the on the website. Um, Josephine, any questions coming through? Yeah, there's actually there's actually quite a few, but they're not all specific to session types. So I think maybe we continue on and we address them after we finish uh, talking about brain dates and before we go into the top tips, Louise. So there's I'll hand over really to good, you. There's a few really good ones. Um, good. So as Louise mentioned, um, those are the four types of sessions that you can select in the um, in the call for proposals form. And we can talk about a bit more of that form later on. I think there's some questions about word counts and what to select. So we'll go into that in a little bit. But I, I wanted to just mention um, the, the brain date concept because that was introduced. We did a, an event in 2020 that was a standalone event and then we incorporated into our virtual event last year. And it's actually, it was very, very popular. And some people really took advantage of the format in itself to do different things. Um, so with brain dates, there's, there's more information on the website. I'll put the link in a minute in the chat, but a brain date is effectively a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a small group conversation. And um, you don't have to submit a proposal for a brain date. So basically anyone can suggest a topic and there will be a marketplace like a like an app or a virtual platform where you can put your topic and then people will connect with you if they're interested in talking about that topic. So the reason I'm bringing it up is because um, we're not doing Inspire videos this year and we're not doing lightning sessions and we're not doing, you know, those small kind of short presentations because we feel that brain dates does fill that gap. And according to the feedback, that is very a uh, very useful format. So again, keep that in, in the in the in the back of your heads so that if you do get accepted for a speaker, brain date is a great complement to your presentation where you can continue the conversation. But also if you don't get accepted, it doesn't mean that you won't be able to talk about the topics that are really important to you because you will still have that opportunity for a structured networking conversation style um, uh, environment. Or, or format. So for more on brain date, please go to the website. We will be adding more information to what a hybrid brain date might look like because we've so far we've only hosted virtual brain dates, but we are hoping to have a brain date lounge in the expo, which will allow you to have actual face-to-face -face, um, brain dates. Wouldn't that be nice, Louise, to have face-to-face -face conversations again? All right. It would indeed. It would indeed. It would. Um, so I think maybe um, I think now we'll take some questions before I go into the top tips. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Do you want me to to do you want to tell Dan how many sessions uh, we've got in the program? Yeah, look, it, it varies, but I would say there are about 50 slots, uh, 40 to 50 slots for 60 minute sessions. And I would say there are about 20 to 34 15 minute sessions so depending on how many proposals we get usually it's one in three or one in four that might get accepted um, so it's, it's highly competitive um, but if we can increase those spots we will but right now we're restricted by the number of rooms we have at the convention center okay and then a question an anonymous question uh word counts is it 250 words the abstract no, um, so the abstract, this is, uh, we, we realized last year with the virtual platform and the app that we actually quite limited in terms of characters. So unfortunately the title is 90 characters and we really can't go over that. So if you wanna use an abbreviation for international education, that's perfectly fine. Try not to abbreviate every word because then it becomes like a text but it's perfectly fine to use some abbreviations. Um, the abstract is a 
650 words that's, oh, that's right. been the same as in previous years and then we also have the learning objectives which is another 150 words um, and that's um, also going to be part of the public program so title abstract and learning objectives are our character uh, word counts and unfortunately we can't go beyond that no and, and Josephine will go into a bit more detail about that in a minute. Um, but another question from Mary. Uh, Mary, you're really onto this, which is terrific. <laughs> um, she's asked, if we select a panel or a roundtable, do we have to propose the other presenters or will you? You need to propose them. You need to have a fully fleshed out proposal, Mary, with all of the speakers and they all must be confirmed. Mm. So I'm sort of asking and answering at the same time. Yeah, and Louise, David, sorry, sorry just question. with that yeah. one. Sorry, just with Mary's question, uh, we could potentially with a panel, perhaps, uh, if they don't want to have a chair, we could nominate a chair from the program or the steering committee if if they really are struggling, we, we could allocate that. But I think for roundtables and cafes, the moderator and the facilitators is central to the content that's being presented. So, so yeah, they would they would need to nominate. All that's fine. Them. And we, we, I realise other conferences that I'm involved in as speaker too, sometimes you opt to be on a panel and they bring the panel together. Ours is a little different. You need to, and Regan's, uh, Regan's asked the same question about will we nominate other panellists? And no, only the chair. Now, David's got a quite a um, detailed question that around some launching of some original research in the specific area to international education, but we don't have the results, learning outcomes, um, how, however, we can preserve, present the research issues, the manner in which this will impact on international education. Effectively, this would be a presentation which would outline the research question and the research process and methodology. Look, David, to my mind, look, it's interesting for us to know that that's going on, but I think delegates would want to know, so what's the outcome um, and what's the relevance of presenting it at this particular point in time. So David, to my mind, that might be a 15 minute presentation, sort of giving headlines about the research, um, but happy to have a conversation offline. It's probably too, too complex at this moment. Um, Louise, can I just um, jump in yeah. here? So I do know in past that when the findings weren't available before the conference that we normally wouldn't accept that presentation. I know that that's been sort of the criteria in the past, one of the things that we have accepted, and I can't remember exactly what year this was, was to use the conference more as a for a focus group situation. So you could use a cafe, for example, where you would outline the methodology and the process and maybe get some feedback there. Um, and also you can also use brain dates for that purpose. Yeah. But I do know that in the past, a straight up presentation, unless the findings were there, most of the committee were not comfortable in approving that presentation. Agree, agree. But as Joe said, brain date, David, might be um, a useful format. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as Louise said, just send us a th an email through and we can guide you a bit more offline on that. Yeah, no worries. Um, there's another question that's just popped up before we go to the next section from Paul. Is it possible to open the virtual group brain dates to unlimited or a larger number of attendees? It could make it easier for the facilitator compared to running repeat sessions. Also reduces the chances of presenting to fewer people where there are attendees cancelling at short notice. Joe, I thought the number yeah. was... <laughs> uh, yeah. This is an interesting one. Um, I think... So the, per, the, the, the central purpose to a brain date has been and, and is always a small group of people interacting and sharing knowledge. If you start to increase the number of group, sorry, the group number, then um, the problem is that there'll be some participants who don't participate as much and others who participate too much. So mm -hmm. there's always that fine line between the number of people that we set the brain date to. We are currently talking with the um, with the developers of brain date to see how many we can increase. Potentially we can increase it to seven or eight to allow that no-show um, rate, but we haven't made a decision on that. The answer I guess will be that we're probably not gonna go more than eight people per brain date. Uh, that's more or less really the limit that they're telling us, you know, is, is the limit, but the, yeah. 
the jury's still out on 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 what we'll eventually do, but it is still going to be very much that small group conversation. Okay, Joe, I think you need to probably move on to the top tips if you're yeah, happy to. Yeah, do. I will. Yeah, I will. I will. Thanks, Louise. Um, so I'll go through this hopefully fairly quickly because a lot of that information is on the website, but it's really just highlighting some of the things that you really need to keep in mind when you're crafting your proposal. So the number one is, I think we've already talked about it, is picking the right session type or format for your content. Now, you know what the different formats are, but what this is about is about thinking, what are you trying to get out of this? And then when you know that, then you can select the right topic. So if what you wanna do is provide information, a download of information, that's a presentation or a panel. If what you're trying to do is uh, enable knowledge sharing and peer-to-peer -peer experience uh, where your peers actually are almost your presenters, then a round table or a cafe session is much more important. A cafe session is great for when you just want to have that conversation. Lots of people are gonna be dying to have that you know, idea of, let's just have a chat about what's happened or about this particular topic. And it's not so much about trying to find an answer to, to a particular problem, then a cafe session is great. If you have an agenda, a challenge, a solution that you really need to get to, maybe a round table is better. So really the number one top tip is understand the different formats, understand what the purpose of what you're trying to achieve and then select the right one. So all the information is on the website. If you're still unsure, just let us know and um, we'll, we'll get back to you. The next tip is um, ensure your title is short. So that's because of the character count, but also that it can stand alone. So don't, so use keywords that are central to your abstract, but don't do something like beyond borders, international education, because that, that doesn't say anything about your session. So make sure that it can stand alone, that it has keywords that give us some kind of understanding of what's in that session. So if your proposal is for the vet sector, make sure that vet is in your title, for example. Um, the next tip is write a strong and succinct abstract. So strong because that's your advertisement. That's what's going to get people in the room watching it live or people watching it on demand. So make sure that it's strong and to the point, but um, also short. So 150 words. Uh, set the scene, give us context. If it's a research, give us, tell us what the methodology was, what the sample size was. Um, if you're trying to solve a problem, make sure, or if it's a cafe or round table, make sure that you explain what the purpose is or what people can expect from that session. Um, the next tip is around the learning objectives. So we've talked about this before. This is for us to understand what is the purpose of your session. And mostly because this will be available to delegates, this is about um, what are delegates going to get out of your session? Are they going to go and just listen to you for 15 minutes and get some really great insights into a particular topic? Or are they going to go in and develop a toolkit or are they gonna go in and just share their experiences? So make it very clear what the learning objectives are for the delegate. Um, the next tip was tip number five. Um, and I think Louise, you've already alerted to this is linking the speakers to your proposal. So often we get great ideas, but no names, no speakers. And even they're not even linked to the proposal. So we don't know who the experts are. So the idea is great, but unless we know that the speakers are available, they're going to be coming and they're booked in, um, we, can't, we, we, we can't really judge the, the proposal just on the content alone. Um, the next one is I think number six, um, I'm flying through these. So Louise, if there are any questions, we can go through them afterwards. Number six is um, ensure that your title, your abstract and your learning objectives accurately reflect what you will present in your presentation. What happens very often is people write a title, an abstract and a learning objective. And then the next question is, okay, tell us how you're going to make this work in a 60 minute slot. And there's a complete disconnect between what they say they wanna do and then how they're gonna do it. So it's really important that where we say, you know, give us some run sheet, it's just, just so we understand how you're gonna use your time and make sure that what 
what you're saying to delegates is actually what you're going to be doing in the session. So um, just make sure that it actually ac accurately reflects what you end up going to be doing on the day. And look, things can change. Obviously, um, we're eight months out. If your proposal gets accepted and something comes about or you have a better idea, we'll work with you to change that. But at this stage of the submission and review, just make sure that um, it aligns correctly with, with what your intentions are. The next tip is um, do not force a square peg into a round hole. So do not try and force the theme beyond borders into your proposal. Yes, it's the overarching theme and it's it's really important, but it's not the all uh, it's not a it's not a it's not a review criteria. So um, don't try to force the word beyond borders in your title or in your abstract if it doesn't naturally fit. You, you're not going to be impacted. You're not going to. We're not going to. We're not going to say no to a great proposal just because it doesn't align exactly with this year's theme. Um, and then number eight. I mean, this is very obvious, but please check your grammar and your spelling. We're not going to decline a proposal just because there's a typo or there's a spelling mistake. But quite often uh, we find proposals and abstracts, especially people who do it at the very last minute, like the night before the deadline, abstract paragraphs are cropped. Um, there's duplication of entries, typical copy and paste mistakes, um, and the grammar as well. We don't have a spell check in the system. So if you wanted to just run it on Word or something before you copy and paste it into the system, um, that would be really helpful. It just shows, um, a little bit of, um, I guess, care. And also sometimes it helps make sure that you're, you're articulating your idea correctly. So um, just, just a bit of care with that. Um, and then the, the last, oh, sorry, now we've got two more tips. So number nine, uh, related <laughs> to the previous one is to, to really prepare in advance. There's a lot of information that you need to provide into the proposal. You don't need to provide a full paper. That's not, that's not necessary. But there is a lot of detail that needs to go in there. And the more detail that you provide, the more information the reviewers have to do a correct assessment of the relevance of that proposal. So make sure that you take your time. And um, I think Mary was asking, can you, can you submit or resubmit? You can submit now, make sure it's in the system, and then go back in a day or two later and add all the other information. This also has the added benefit that once you add a speaker to your proposal, they can also go into the system and view it. So they can also be that second pair of eyes. So don't leave it till the night before. Um, just get in early and start preparing all the information that you're going to need. And also, if you have questions, just send them through to us at AIC at IDP.com. And then that way we can help you as well craft it or answer any, any questions you might have. And I guess the final um, tip is just to look at abstracts from previous conferences. So if you go to this link, um, you'll also see, I'll put it in the chat. You'll also see that um, how we've written proposals and so how we've written abstracts in previous years. And that helps you as well to see how we worded things or you know, how you could word them for this year. So that's uh, my final tip, Louise. So I've gone through it very quickly. There is a page on the website called top tips or submission tips or something like that. So do go through that because um, it will go into a bit more detail of what I've covered here very quickly. Brilliant. Um, okay, so now on the screen, you've got the summary of the- Yeah, the this is the summary of the of the top 10. And, um, and like you can see, there's a, a, yeah. a, a link there, so. And I've got- questions? Yeah, there are. And I've popped into the chat the link to the past conferences if you want to have a look at what um, other abstracts from previous conferences. So um, Alison has asked, is it possible to have a wait list for the brain dates for popular sessions? It's not a bad idea. I just don't know if it's possible. We might have to no, back well, to We don't one. need to because you can just recreate a topic. So if, if you put a topic up and you already get five people, let's say we then you can just create another brain date same topic but just different time so another five people can come in if if what you mean is right if oh, i see what you mean so if if someone wants to get into a brain date but it's already full um mm, 
I'll investigate. I'm not sure it's possible, but um, on, I know that on the day, if you, um, one of the things you can do because we have learning concierge, both in person and virtually, you can drop into the lounge or the virtual lounge and ask them, is there any no shows or are there any virtual brain dates happening right now that I can join? And they'll actually help you navigate that. And they'll say, well, yeah, actually there's this one. And you can either go in there into the virtual chat room or on the day you'll be able to go into the in-person room. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And then an anonymous question. Um, does the speaker, if lucky enough to be picked, uh, come with a free ticket for the conference or do they have to pay the full price? Sadly, it doesn't come with a free ticket, but there is a discounted price for the speakers. Jo, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, we do make some exceptions with um, international students, for example. So if you have a uh, because a student voice is really important and if you have a really great speaker, we would um, potentially consider a day registration or a virtual registration so they can log in and come to the session. Um, and we've sometimes um, made an exception for delegates who might be outside of the international education sector who would never attend. So there is a question on the form for you to um, make your request. So if you feel that a speaker would not come if they don't uh, get a, a free registration, put it in there, we will put it to the steering committee, uh, sorry, to the program committee, and we will get back to you on that. But it's it has to be exceptional cases uh, where we would waive the, the registration completely. Um, there's one other question, um, I'm just trying to read it. Is it possible to have the brain dates, um, to have a minimum number of participants to be conducted? I had numerous dates last year that had four participants and then one um, at the actual time because of no-shows. Yeah, sadly, mm -hmm. I had that experience too. Um, I had a nice little chat by myself with one of them, but um, not quite sure how we manage that. That's why that idea of going yeah. to the, the learning concierge, I think I'd like a life concierge. That would be really cool. Um, there will a be a life concierge. concierge. Yeah, that they can actually help you, um, you know, to yeah. say, look, let's push people into these areas, there's spots here. But that's something we can take on board, uh, an anonymous yeah. person. And Louise, just um, just on that feedback, I, I don't know when that brain date was um, scheduled, but one thing that we noticed last year was that all or most of the brain dates on the Tuesday, which was the first day of the event where there wasn't a lot of sessions, um, on that day, a lot of the brain dates didn't get filled out or people forgot and it was because it was that first day and a lot of people just forgot even though we send them multiple reminders and things whereas on the Wednesday Thursday and Friday it was very different the no-show rate was very very low so yeah. we will continue to work on how we can decrease that no-show rate um, and one of the options would be to maybe increase the number of participants from say five to maybe seven or eight. So we have to work with brain data at the moment to find the best solution for that. Okay, and there's one last question popped in, we're nearly out of time, uh, which is, will further information be made available about how to book slash engage and take part in brain dates? It was confusing for presenters and attendees, apparently. Uh, I'm imagining the answer to that is yes, there will be more information coming out from AIEC. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And what we find is every year when we're bringing a new initiative, it does get uh, confusing. I think also last year there was a lot of new ideas and new things. So, uh, but definitely this year we will, um, there's already a lot of information on the website. And as soon as we lock in the hybrid model, we will also be adding that information. Um, we'll also do a uh, ambassador well, sort of like a brain date tutorial which we didn't do last year because the year before nobody attended so now we'll bring that back in um definitely for for everyone because i think um it, it will be quite useful so absolutely taking that comment on board louise okay well i think that's it for the questions um thank you all so much for for taking time out to to listen to us and ask your questions this session's been recorded so it'll be on the the website um, and I'll hand back to Josephine to to wrap up. Look forward to seeing uh, you on the Gold Coast. 
Yeah, thank you, Louise. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone, obviously, on behalf of IDP and IAA for, you know, your content and your ideas and, and your, your time. Um, we have a really dedicated program committee made up from representatives from the IAA networks, uh, as well as experts in the industry. And we're really looking forward to some, some really some great content. Louise already alerted that we had a workshop last week, or maybe you didn't, but we, uh, we had a great workshop with um, some really great people really looking forward to all of your ideas. So they are experts and they're looking forward to receiving your proposals please do send an email to AIC at idp.com if you do have further questions that didn't come up today or they come up while you're crafting your proposal and we'll filter them to the right experts um, as needed. And again, good luck to everyone. Have a think, have a, you know, a think about what, what you can contribute and we're really looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.